The Firm, India's only show on corporate law, tax and audit matters. Over 3 lakh crore rupees of public money is stuck in bad assets or non-performing loans, many of them insolvent companies. The World Bank says resolving insolvency takes over four years in India and the average recovery is 25 cents to the dollar. The Sikh Industrial Companies Act or SICA and the Board of Industrial Financial Reconstruction or BIFR have both failed to speedily revive or liquidate companies and recover assets. And so, a committee appointed by the government has proposed a new bankruptcy code. Any financial default can trigger an insolvency resolution process. The applicant can be a financial creditor, an operational creditor or the company itself. If the application is accepted by the NCLT, a resolution professional will be appointed to oversee the resolution process, which must be completed within 180 days extendable by a maximum 90 days or else the company goes into liquidation. In the interim, a calm period or moratorium will stay all creditors' claims. The powers of the board of directors will be suspended and the company management will report to the resolution professional. A committee of creditors will decide on the revival plan and the NCLT has the final say. Well, to discuss this new approach and all these new features, I have with me a veteran panel, Cyril Shroff, Managing Partner at Cyril Amarchand Mangaldas, Vinayak Bahuguna, CEO and MD of India's largest asset reconstruction company, Arsil, Alok Dhir, Managing Partner, Dhir & Dhir Associates, a law firm that specializes in restructuring and insolvency, and M.G. Vaidyan, Deputy Managing Director of State Bank of India, the head of the Stressed Assets Management Group. Gentlemen, to all four of you, a very warm welcome. SICA requires total net worth erosion. The Companies Act requires failure to pay 50% or more secured creditors. But the proposed bankruptcy code says any financial default will do to trigger an insolvency application. And the application can be filed by a financial creditor such as a bank or an operational creditor such as an employee because unpaid employees or suppliers are the first sign of financial stress. The default is actually the outcome of stress. Correct. So the, the uh, committee was of the view that the stress is already in the system. Correct. The debtors and creditors are already negotiating. Right. So the point of time when a default occurs is the point of time which is the urgency which is required. Absolutely. It is detection at the earliest possible stage to preserve value. Yeah. It is a big change. And I think uh, it can be used as an indicator to really assess what's going on behind the thinking of the of the new proposed legislation. Okay. Uh, firstly, I think what it does is it seeks to move uh, the regime from a revival and a recovery mechanism, which was the, the, the existing regime that exists today, to more of a resolution process. So in order to start the journey, because this only merely starts the journey, right. uh, the financial default has been treated as the trigger. But that's not the end of the story. Then it sort of moves through a series of steps. Uh, and those steps and that journey is quite different from what it was uh, under the existing regime. Mr. Vaidyan, do you feel encouraged by this change in approach, the fact that you don't need 50% of the secured creditors to come together to move an application for an insolvency process? You don't need to wait for net worth erosion before the company is half dead to attempt to revive the company or put it back on the profitability track. This is uh, one of the... Uh, um, the uh, best part of this uh, legislation uh, being thought of uh, and I am sure that this will give a lot of comfort to the banks uh, uh, which are having uh, significant uh, amounts uh, tied up in bad assets. Absolutely uh, dot uh, on, on the spot here. I think I like the urgency that this uh, legislation will bring to the problem of uh, growing distress uh, and alarming levels of distressed uh, loans in the market. The monumental shift proposed by the Bankruptcy Code is a shift in the balance of power from equity to debt as the company's management and board lose their powers to the resolution professional and the committee of creditors. Also, the creditor field has been leveled. All creditors, secured and unsecured, have a say in the committee proportionate to their exposure. 
The second change to the credit hierarchy is on liquidation. What do you make of this shift in balance of power? It just Trump? lies at the heart of what the change is in terms of rebalancing the power between the equity and the debt. And this is not a journey that just started, I think, with uh, with this legislation. I think the journey started with the Companies Act 2013, where uh, in a sort of environment where such a preponderant proportion of our companies have family control or promoter controlled enterprises, there was just too much power and there was very little distinction between the shareholding controlling body and the boards. So the first step in correcting that balance happened in the manner in which the Companies Act 2013 turned out. And the second blow, I think, is this in terms of rebalancing and making sure that the rights of the creditors, uh, and, and then therefore that there should be no divine right which the promoters or the board should have to believe that they are the only ones who will have control over the destiny of the company. And I think the second point in terms of in the universe of debt, I think there are two big changes that have been made, is that all financial creditors have been put together in one bucket. Uh, and I think what that means is I think there's a big psychological uh, uh, issue over here because the earlier system of different classes of creditors where secured creditors voted separately and unsecured creditors voted separately, all that undergoes a fundamental change because now the denominator is much larger. Okay. I would just like to add one point here. Sure. You did mention the, the shift, the balance shift. And I, I think we have to recognize it in a sense that it is not perpetual. It mm. is for a resolution purpose uh, which sets the ground in motion which eventually at the end of it is trying to see that entities uh, are stabilized, they continue to trade and are able to trade, Correct. which means eventually it should also benefit the, the shareholders. Yes, of course. It's a very monumental shift. It's just the pendulum has swung. The legislations in rescue and bankruptcy the world over are either debtor in possession or creditor in possession. Okay. There are the two. That's how the pendulum and swings. And we've been debtor in possession We so have far. been, so far, the Indian uh, jurisprudence has been on the basis of debtors in possession and it is completely now being changed to creditors in possession. There's great deal of value to either concepts. Neither of them is perfect. Debtors are the people who have run businesses and they know how to run businesses and for somebody to step in on one fine day and say I'm going to run the business which is a very very complex uh, uh, operation to even during the uh, calm period of 180 days is going to be a very immense challenge and serious destruction in value can happen. I'm not saying one is good or the other is better. It's a question that needs to be debated. But may I argue, across Alu, the board. that the debtors in possession concept has failed us so far? I personally believe that shifting at this stage, there is no infrastructure. We don't have insolvency professionals. Today you are saying that I'm going to hand over the management to an insolvency professional who's actually untried. Are we going to destroy value like this? Is there a compromise? Is there a possibility of allowing the management to work under very serious controls of the creditors? This shifts the entire primacy of the entire process of uh, resolution as well as the bankruptcy into the hands of the creditors. Are we ready for it? Because under this provision, as you are aware, even the workers' dues are being uh, preserved only to the extent of one year. Hmm. Is this something that will be acceptable to the political system in the country? Uh, Alok's raised a very important point. That said, uh, the debtor in position business hasn't really worked for us in the past. And there is nothing that stops the administrator of the scheme and the creditors who work with him uh, to do the right thing, whether it's to continue with the existing management or to bring other experts into the game to make it work. So Take I don't think he's needs. replacing management. The bill says that the management yes. will report to him, that is the resolution pro professional, and that the board's, the, powers get, yeah, the board's powers get suspended and the management reports to him. See, is this going to be a big, yeah. big hurdle to get over? I think it's about the center of power. Yeah. So I get this is a big cultural change, but it's is it not required no, is it my is. point? It is, absolutely it I is, because we know how things have worked in the past. I think it was an either or. And uh, it had to be done like this. Uh, we have to make sure it works. So it has to work with the but management the on the ground. The resolution professional will be working with a committee of creditors. So the creditors also want the best for the company. Yes. And the management is not going to be sacked overnight. The management will simply report into him and the board's powers are suspended. So all decisions will actually be taken by the creditors through the resolution professional. Let's put it that way, aligned. right? I think there right. is a, there is a uh, serious calibration which is required. I think an abrupt change, even in the center of power, as he is saying, can be detrimental to the interests of the company. All that I am advocating is, between these two, debtor in possession and creditor in possession, 
at least in the initial year till the infrastructure has grown till the insolvency professionals have grown and we see how their performance will be a calibrated approach may have been better you know the sdr mechanism has come in yeah, sure. five six companies have been taken over in none of these companies they've been able to engineer a change of management but let me also tell you this there are Which some massive reconstruction companies that have now taken over large assets for instance party shipyard or leela hotels and have brought in professional management from the outside to work with the incumbent management and revive the assets if i'm correct and and these are all experiments work in progress but they are these are efforts to revive as opposed to asset strip and you know make no, 25 no, cents on I the mean, dollar as the but uh, as you know with respect to bharti shipyard it has taken them more than 6 months more more, more time you're right even enough. more time but these are days is not but it's an effort because it's the first time it's an effort it's an effort Uh, the point i want to sort of uh, get into now and we can check with mr vedan also is the uh, the whole point about the uh, the rules about the hierarchies into say between creditors right please uh, in yeah. this and uh, we have some serious concerns there which are um you know it this uh, uh, sort of legislation seems to suggest that everyone gets into one common melting pot which mm. is i think good it's holistic it was required Uh, to take care of everyone's interest but you see how a creditor committee works um if you are working where your primary sort of um, uh, mandate is to first figure out how to pay uh, the operational creditors which may be suppliers unpaid <coughs> suppliers and the likes hmm. um then uh, the ability to sort of put out the best possible structure I uh, might get somewhat compromised in terms of uh, cash usage and 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 the likes and then within that uh, if you are not going to differentiate between uh, different asset uh, uh, sort of owners in terms of rights whether it's secured or unsecured it, it has the ability to sort of make the pot so big that uh, it becomes a little difficult to manage are you suggesting that secured and unsecured mu- must not get an equal footing if i if i've understood the gist That's of your comment that's the rule of the jungle isn't it at the end of the day okay mr vaidyan your thoughts on a the shift in balance between equity to debt the fact that uh, it's the creditor committee of creditors and the resolution professional that will in a sense run the company uh with help from the incumbent management during the resolution process and the reordering of hierarchy the equality between secured and unsecured creditors all of those thoughts uh from the bank's point of view to tell you some practical uh, problems like uh, we are secured creditors but when we go to sell the assets we find that there are no assets now we have given loans against inventory we have given uh, loans against uh, receivables by the time the account goes bad the inventory value is almost nil the receivables uh, are also nil and the other assets uh, uh, may be there may not be there even if it is there it is deteriorated and uh, you know may not be having any value our records finally comes down only to the collateral given by the promoters and even there the today situation is that when we have gone through the legal process 5 years 6 years 7 years and when we are about to auction the property then some notices will come from uh, various agencies like it excise and various uh, you know the service tax and all and say that uh, the status quo has to be maintained because the company has defaulted in all these things so ultimately what happens is that the sale cannot be uh you know executed the way it is expected so all these are the problems which even we being a secured creditor are going through so in this uh, new legislation which is being thought of it is uh, so welcome in the sense that uh, immediately the creditors uh, whether they are secured or uh, unsecured uh, will have some uh, say in the way the assets are managed otherwise whether secured or unsecured everybody ultimately will get nothing So if I understand you correctly you are in favor of all the monumental changes that are happening here secured creditors are are still number 1 and the the dues to government and the other payments are uh, not uh, placed above the secured creditors whereas today it is not so at least uh, they can bring stay and the best part of the thing is that uh, there is no other civil court anybody have got jurisdiction over this so all those uh, innumerable number of stay orders which we are getting every day in the drt process probably will vanish i would like to react to this you <coughs> have to see the entire hierarchy that has been defined under the new code right in the context and the perspective in which it is defined 
they have said that if the early detection is what they are requiring so which means at the point of early detection the company is not so badly gone that it cannot preserve value for unsecured creditors therefore at the initial stage of the first default is the perspective at that stage there is possibility of retaining value for unsecured creditors therefore in the creditors committee the financial yes, creditors sit in yes. and their interests are watched but interestingly when a scheme is prepared you have to provide for such value for them as which is not less than what they will get in liquidation okay. so a scheme will be will be prepared put to the committee and by 75% vote which includes secured and unsecured and it preserves value for the unsecured creditors to the extent they will get in liquidation so that's right. the perspective coming down to the disturbing of the hierarchy as mr vaidyan has said in fact the secured creditor continue to remain and have primacy at the stage after the initial 180 or 270 days of resolution process hmm. they come back into the picture as the prime prima donna correct they are the ones who are entitled to keep their security out of the pool or if they allow their security to remain within the pool they will get the value of their security first after that in fact uh, different from what is happening today we had a pari paisu charge with workmen mm -hmm. and workmen dues used to accumulate to very large amounts particularly right. in closed units now under this new mechanism you are preserving only 3 months of dues Correct. at pari paisu stage with the secured creditors right. so secured creditors will end up getting a much larger pie okay. one further change which we haven't talked about <coughs> in the example that alok gave so uh, once the secured creditor decides whether he is in the process or out of the process and relies on his security which is fine so that's not disturbed but if there is any shortfall that remains then he is uh, then he is actually subordinated even to other unsecured creditors so the previous regime was that all unsecured creditors including the residue hmm. that is available to a secured creditor all pari paso that's no longer the case Most new bankruptcy code relies considerably on a new class of professionals resolution professionals to manage the company during the resolution process it also proposes the creation of information utilities to supply real time financial information on the company and thus aid the resolution process the eligibility criteria for both will be decided by the insolvency and bankruptcy board that will also regulate the bankruptcy process the development of insolvency professionals will take its own time we have a lot of high quality professionals in the country whether they are lawyers whether they are accountants all the operating agencies that work in sika they are not good operating enough operating agencies are I think actually liquidators and receivers will have some of the some of the expertise okay. but what i would say is the operating <coughs> agency is more in the nature of a insolvency professional agency Hmm. rather than an insolvency professional so Fair divisions enough. within the within the banks which are dealing with these matters could then convert themselves into insolvency professional agencies okay these agencies will be self regulating agencies they will insist on certain qualifications and they will lay down criteria for training of people which the board the bankruptcy board will actually prescribe will right? prescribe and these will all follow and there. self regulate get so then what will happen is this will generate in turn a whole legion of professionals who would in turn manage this entire affair the only concern is that it will take some time so what do you put the cart before the horse do you get to create this whole series of professionals this group of professionals before you start the process or you are going to first start the process of uh, implementing the code without having this qualitative infrastructure in your hand similarly the entire code is based on the information so they are wanting to ensure that the information asymmetry which is there between the debtors and creditors is actually removed by way of the information utilities which are going to be uh, uh, created under this that itself will take a long time in creation and the information that has to be plugged into the information utilities will take even more time to create totally agree with dalo uh, <coughs> uh, my uh, not fair uh, my let me put it it's yeah. a concern yeah. and and on the other side a hope that if we were to make this uh, new code to work it must have uh, gleaming highways which uh, you know allow us to work uh, expeditiously and professionally uh, training of people being able to pick the right kind of people and uh, put them through the grill and uh, 
the information utilities, I see that as a huge challenge. Um, you know, the kind of More stuff. More than huge challenge, right? It because is. Because today, I think, I mean, getting any financial information that's not already disclosed by companies, uh, you know. It is impossible. And what it happens takes days. Also and here, at least in the process prescribed in this bill, the NCLT has two days to admit or reject a resolution application. And in those two days, it has to reach out to the information utility. And thereafter also, in the process of resolution, yeah. you need to have real-time information coming in from the information absolutely. utility and don't forget on the financials of the company. Yeah, absolutely. And don't forget the government has a 30-year limitation period. So people wake up after a while and uh, put a claim in front of you. How do you deal with it? Yeah. Uh, so obviously, all of this must come together on day one when people can then take informed calls. Yeah. This is a valuable forward. point. You know, I think unfortunately, sir, and if I may point this out to you, our laws have never lacked in the right intention. It's almost always the infrastructure that fails us. If we embark on this exercise before we put these highways in place, are we setting ourselves up for failure? How do we put the I horse before the cart? Yeah, I know. And I think I believe it has been a step proved that the chicken came first. So <laughs> I think the chick, this this legislation is the chicken, and I think you have to take that call. You know, that's been the case with everything. I mean, look when the competition uh, commission and the competition law started, you had the same issue. So uh, where you first got the legislation and then you built the capacity, and now it's working fine. Mr. Vaidyan, you may be vegetarian, but which one came first, the chicken or the egg? <laughs> but whatever it is, let me let me say that uh, let these challenges that are in front of us deter us from not seeing the positive points that can come out of this legislation. Even for financial inclusion uh, of all the families in the country, there was a challenge. But then when the challenge came, the bankers stood up and then they ensured that uh, all the households in this country has got bank accounts. So similarly, it will happen. That's a fair point, but I think it's important to highlight the challenges because otherwise these tend to sort of go under the radar, transition day one issues, yeah. Uh, when it comes into force, uh, if all creditors want to jump and get into this, how is that going to be managed? Yeah, Bhavan, it's not just this uh, the sort of infrastructure with these professionals. There is uh, so much more work going to come to the DRT. There is so much more work yeah. that is going to come to, come NCLT to the NCLT. And the NCLT. NCLT, NCLT. So, there is a question of capacity building there as well. That so, this is point. massive. It's like building a new city, like Amrava. <coughs> I mean, you've got well, a piece of Well, at least of 10 land. of them. And I think ah. there's going to be another big issue in terms of the regulatory model that has been chosen for these uh, professions uh, or these new class of professionals is how they're going to manage conflicts. So let's say if an accounting firm sets up one of these uh, uh, you know resolution professionals, can they also be the auditor for that uh, enterprise? I, would say I think not. this whole thing is going to be so ridden with conflicts that... Uh, and which the bankruptcy board ideally will have to regulate. Yeah, right? so I think they'll have to first take the issue of you know who is fit and proper, how right. do you avoid conflict, what is code of conduct, and I don't think the self-regulatory model is either the model that they have been taken or have been chosen or is going to work. It will have to be a licensing model. The proposed bankruptcy code mandates a calm period or moratorium during the 180-day resolution process in which the NCLT halts all suits, court proceedings, asset transfers, foreclosures, property recovery, etc. This was mandatory under SICA but not the Companies Act 2013. As for the 180, or shall I say 270 day deadline, well, it's most critical to the success of this new code. But is it achievable? There, there's only one huge missing factor in that, which is court orders that can be passed in the meantime. And India has a sort of a long history of particularly of our writ courts who may interfere along the way and how that will actually add to the timelines whether there will be clock stops or it's a hard period of 180 plus 90 days is one of the things which the judiciary will I'd have like to... I'd like to believe that maybe that attitude is now changing in the judiciary. I'd like to believe that with the introduction of things like commercial courts, again, which have hard it's stops changing, and timelines, but, you know, there are so many the judiciary in the country. is coming to appreciate to move faster on things. You're right, but I think the final word on this will be the judiciary, not anyone else. The other point I just want to, you know, just bring in if yeah. you might, is, is issues about who actually uh, sets the ground? How does it sort of stay in control of the creditor committee for voting? Because we also have parallel state uh, legislated uh, points like uh, the Relief Undertaking Act and stuff. And what happens to that and the ability of people to use that? Uh, that needs to be brought into Give the Give me umbrella. an illustration so I can understand. Well, there are a number of states in the country hmm. which have the power to legislate and have done so 
to bring a relief status for uh, industrial undertakings, okay. which actually then puts uh, all matters on hold. Okay. Effectively, in terms of enforcement of predator rights. Okay, so will these have to sort of subsequently get amended yeah. along with everything else? Yeah. It gets yeah. amended yeah. So for this, yes. this yeah. to work, yes. Yes. right? Yes. It's so and as Cyril mentioned, there, there are so many other courts no involved. Right. So you know, all those checks and balances have to make sure that this process works and nobody interferes. You have a concern about the fact that 180 days, 270 days is all good for the first level of the process. There is really nothing spelt out for the appeal in the NCLAT and there can be nothing spelt out for any final appeal at the Supreme Court. So this could still become a very, very long process. Without uh, putting a date to the appeal uh, process, the timeline, I think it just dilutes it quite significantly. Uh, in, in the question of uh, further appeal process within the Supreme Court, I think that's fine. Uh, I think in the right of equity, that no, ought that to be allowed I'm not and it will take whatever time it takes, but at least uh, you cross the first hurdle if the appeal period at the NCLAT is defined. No, see this 180 days uh, and 270 days and all 9 months and 4 and a half months. For the fast track it is for 4 and a half months I think. So this is uh, too short a time uh, on the face of it. But my take on this is a little different, you know, like w with all the past legislation and procedures and uh, all those things uh, that we had, how many years it used to take for any sorts of resolution, not this BAFR and other things and all. So I will say in this uh, six months time or nine months time, even if a small number of companies could find some resolution that itself is a big achievement, I will say. Traditionally, the courts have been giving, have been very liberal in giving time. Correct. And there is somehow a sense that debtors get the better of the creditors in courts in the country. Uh, there is uh, certainly yeah, I, the courts tend I to think that the favor. The key, key message for the judiciary would be to stop seeing themselves only as resolvers of disputes, but also as an instrument of economic policy. Absolutely. <laughs> The Bankruptcy Law Reform Committee has recommended amendments to the Seeker Repeal Act, Companies Act, LLP Act, Surfacey Act, the Debt Recovery Act and Partnership Act. Maybe more will have to change, including in tax law, before this new bankruptcy code can work. The question is, will it? The big picture what I am seeing is that uh, this will totally change the credit culture in the country. The... the, um, uh, the the borrower uh, probably the borrower the probably will not get a free hand in doing whatever he wants to do and for any number of years and going from one court to another court and bringing injunctions whenever he wants all those things probably will get adjusted with this the, the importance is that uh, capital needs to churn it can find new owners but perhaps that's all for the best because in the larger interest i think that works best for the country in addition to giving us a better rescue and bankruptcy law in the country, there are two very important aspects it also simultaneously considers. One is that it will improve the ease of doing business in the country. Yes. Uh, the rankings will improve. The second is that there is another benefit that this legislation seeks to bring in, and that is to bring in a completely new corporate debt market in the country. So, on the intent, <laughs> I would give it a 10 on 10. On the macro and conceptual points, I would give it an 8 on 10. And on the detail, I would give it a 5 on 10. I think they've underestimated some of the details and, and they're going to, I think in order to make it operational, uh, there are going to be a lot of chinks which could be exploited uh, by debtors and borrowers in courts. So a lot of uncertainties along the way, but they can be easily fixed. The Firm, India's only show on corporate law, tax and audit matters.